today. We have two presenters and they both have slides. This is wonderful. Um, this is being recorded, so it is available as part of the entire video series from this conference. I'm Melinda Hemmelgarn. I am a registered dietitian and I serve on the board of Beyond Pesticides. And it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Michelle Cashin. She is a farmer and project manager at the Brooklyn Grange Rooftop Farm in Brooklyn, New York. Michelle? Hello. I'm just going to get my slides up. Cool. Hi. Um, yeah, so my name is Michelle. Um, I'm from Queens. Um, and I started working at Brooklyn Grange uh, five years ago in 2014. Um, I started off in our farm crew. Um, I've also given tours. I worked in our events department, um, worked at our farmer's market, um, kind of like a jack of all trades for the first two years at Brooklyn Grange. Um, and then in my third season, I started managing our Brooklyn Navy Yard farm. So it's the farm that you see here. Um, it's about an acre and a half. Um, and it was probably one of the most rewarding experiences of my life. Um, I really loved it, did it for three years. And then this past season, I transitioned to our design build team, which I'm gonna talk a little bit more about in future slides. Um, and so now I'm a project manager within design build. Um, let me just make sure my slides are up. Okay, so. Um, first, I'm going to talk a little bit about Brooklyn Grange and then um, a little bit about food systems as a whole. But um, to start, I just figured I'd go over a little bit of urban farming in New York City. Um, we're definitely not the first to, ha to farm within the city. Um, so these are some really cool shots of a World War I garden, Jackson Heights, um, a school garden in, from 1902. Um, and then, of course, New York City was once like all farmland, so people have been farming here for many, many years, many generations. Um, this one's really cool because it's on a rooftop, so we're not even the first uh, company or first people to farm on rooftops in New York. And so this is from a World War II children's garden, um, and it looks like they're, you know, raking out beds, getting ready to plant, which is really neat. Um. So why did Brooklyn Grange come into existence? Um, let me just move to this guy. Um, so our industrial food system really separates us from agriculture. Um, it's kind of like when you go to the grocery store, you see your food, but you're totally disconnected from where it comes from, how it's grown, who grows it, um, what kind of chemicals or lack thereof they're using. Um, basically, all of the hard parts of farming are kind of removed from our daily lives. Um, so Brooklyn Grange, part of the, the efforts behind Brooklyn Grange was to really connect people to their food and also just to bring food back into this city. Um, because our living in New York or living in any other city, you're really separated um, from your food sources and also from nature in general. Um, ooh, you didn't write it. Um, and even community gardens, which are hugely beneficial to different neighborhoods in the city are oftentimes threatened by development. They're at the mercy of parks. A lot of community gardens are on parks grounds. Um, and oftentimes, they're fighting within the New York City bureaucracy to stay in existence. Um, so Brooklyn Grange is a for-profit business. Um, so we can work independently without you know, having to deal with a lot of the things that community gardens or shared plots um, might, might deal with. Um, so Brooklyn Grange, what, what is Brooklyn Grange? We are um, a triple bottom line business. Um, I'm sure you've heard of triple bottom line businesses before. It's definitely not something new. Um, but we try to incorporate not just profit, um, not just the bottom line, but we try to incorporate people, our community, as well as the planet. Um, so I'm going to go over each of these um, in a little more detail. So the ecological benefits, so planet, is by far the easiest part of Brooklyn Grange. We're adding green space into the city on top of rooftops where previously there was no green space. Um, this picture is from a couple years ago. At the end of the season, we planted um, oats as cover crop, and it's just so lush blowing in the wind. It looks really good. Um, so yeah, the ecological benefits are de is definitely the easiest part of um, rooftop farming. And um, as you can see, 
green spaces on top of roofs are not um, new. Uh, this is a picture, I'm, I'm not quite sure where, but obviously um, green roofs have been around for quite some time. I think in like the gardens of Babylonia, they had um, different types of rooftop terraces where they were growing food or vegetation. Um, so yeah, there, there's, and there's all different types. There's this more like intensive kind and then just like grass or sedum on a rooftop. Um, so you can see how much it's changed, how far we've come. Um, but what is a green roof? A green roof is basically um, different layers of materials that you put on a roof that allow for vegetation. Um, obviously the top layer, the soil, is uh, where you grow your vegetables, but underneath that you have usually a void, so some type of material that allows water to travel through um, to the drains, like with the pitch of the roof. Um, and then usually there's materials in between like this void and the soil to protect each layer and also to protect the roof. Um, so that's like the very basics of what, of what a green roof is. We're not directly farming on top of a roof. There's a whole system below that protects the roof and allows us to farm pretty intensively. And there's two types of green roofs. There's um, extensive and intensive. Extensive is really shallow soil. It's about, it can be like two inches maybe, and usually that's where you'll see like the sedum or um, on the Barclay Center in downtown Brooklyn, they have, I think it's just like grass on top of the green roof, on top of the roof, and so that's very shallow soil, minimal maintenance, minimal watering, um, but provides similar ecological benefits to the city. Um, and then there's intensive, and that's a little deeper. You can grow vegetables, and that's what we have on our roof. So our soil ranges from in the walkways, it could be like three inches of soil, and then in the beds, which we mound up so that the soil is concentrated there where we're growing, it can range from eight inches to like 14 inches, depending on um, what's being grown there. Um, okay, stormwater management's pretty, a pretty interesting part about green roofs and just adding green space back into the city in general. Um, stormwater management, so you can see by these diagrams, so Basically, have you guys heard of combined sewer overflow in New York? So combined su sewer overflow is a result of our sewage system. And our sewage system was built, I mean, New York's not that old, but it's old enough where our sewage system is kind of outdated in that we have um, all of the water from residences, from businesses running into our sewage system and then going to our treatment plants but the water that comes from rainflow also goes into the same lines. And when it becomes inundated, they have to basically relieve all that burden of all the water from millions of people flushing their toilets, using their showers, and it goes into our waterways, which is pretty gross. Um, and obviously this was built when there were fewer people in the city, when there was more green space, um, but now it's really an issue because we're polluting our waterways. I mean, if you go to like Gowanus or I forget the name of the canal in Long Island City, but it's not a very pleasant uh, like place to be. Um, so the way to combat this, the city did a study that basically showed they could either spend a lot of money replacing the sewage lines or they could just add green space back into the city. Um, and how does this work? So if you add green space, you're not necessarily absorbing the water that might come from like a heavy rainfall, but you are slowing it down. So by adding green infrastructure into the city, you're slowing down the rate at which water gets to the pipes um, and basically alleviating the burden that like a large rainfall would put um, on our sewage system. So that's another ecological benefit um, of adding green infrastructure, of adding back, you know, parks or green roofs, which is what we do. Um, urban heat island effect is also mitigated by adding green space back into the city. Um, urban heat island effect essentially is during the day, if it's 90 degrees out, the, um, it'll get really hot in the city. All of the rooftops, all of the tarmac abs is absorbing all of that heat. And then at night, it's just being released back into the city. So it never really cools off even at night. Um, but if you're in a suburban area or a rural area, 
um, at night, it gets pretty cool, right? It really cools off when the sun goes down. So urban, um, so that's the urban e heat island effect. And obviously adding green space back into the city helps mitigate that because our rooftops are absorbing heat and then we're not releasing it back into the air afterwards. Um, some other ecological benefits, uh, increasing wildlife habitat. We've seen all types of birds, but pretty cool. We've seen kestrels. Um, we've seen, tur oh, I forgot the name of the turkey something. I can't remember. No, I just know kestrels and then another, another hawk. Um, but we've also seen um, ducks on one of our roofs in Williamsburg, um, a little family of ducks congregated on, on the rooftop. Um, so yeah, we, we, tr we attract a lot of wildlife. Unfortunately, that also means pigeons that eat our seeds. Um, but it's pretty cool when you get to see a hawk flying around and then it perches um, either on the water tower or like right next to the chicken coop because it's interested in the chickens. Um, but then also insects. So we see a lot of honeybees, of course, but also native pollinators to the city. We see all different types of butterflies, monarchs, swallowtails. Um, so it's pretty amazing. And then just like all different kinds of critters, grasshoppers, um, crickets. It's pretty, pretty cool to be up on one of these rooftops in the summer. Um, also, green roofs will reduce the energy use of your building. They'll, decre they'll decrease noise pollu uh, pollution. Um, so the ecological benefits are pretty... Uh, limitless. This is cool. So this is our first farm. Um, this is our flagship farm in Long Island City. It was built in 2010 and it's about an acre. Um, it's actually what's kind of interesting about this building is that it's two buildings and at one point they joined them together so you can kind of see where it turns in the uh, right side of the building on the screen. It like angles in a different direction um, but at one point they merged them together or added on the second part, I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, so this is our uh, first farm, built in 2010, about an acre. And then this is our Navy Yard farm, which was built in 2012. And this one's an acre and a half of rooftop space. Um, and this, so this was the farm that I managed for three years. Um, yeah, they've since built like a big building in the harbor in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. So it's a even we're not we're at the mercy of New York City buildings, um, and then we built a third farm in Sunset Park this past summer, and that one's three acres, so it's double the size of this roof, um, and we're going to have our first full season up there. And um, not only is it a farm, but we're building um, a huge greenhouse. So this greenhouse is pretty tiny; it's like ten by thirty feet, um, and we bu we're building or we built sorry like a five thousand square foot greenhouse on top of the one in Sunset Park. And then we're also building out a indoor, an indoor event space too, so we can have events all year round. Um, so a little bit about our farming strategy. Um, we've got some vegetables and also our greenhouse during the winter, growing microgreens. Um, and obviously I know this is a, pest, a conference about pesticides, so I figured I'd talk a little bit about our pesticide use. Um, so we grow according to organic standards. Um, we rarely, if at all, use pesticides, and if we do, they're all organic approved. Um, the main one that I've ever used is Pyganic, um, and that actually biodegrades with, within three hours, I believe, of application. So it's very, I mean, it's obviously it's a pesticide, but probably one of the most innocuous pesticides of, of you know, the range of pesticides out there. Um, but other than that, we're, we would much rather rely on uh, beneficial insects. So we release ladybugs, um, we've released lacewing flies, also um, predatory mites. We've had spider mites in the past. Um, so we'd much rather use those applications or just even, you know, pulling crops when we've, uh, when the pests have gotten too far gone or, you know, like manually squishing aphids is not exactly how I want to spend my day farming, but it has been like a three-hour task at times. Um, so yeah, our pesticide use is very minimal, um, thankfully. And that's not just because we want to be a steward of, uh, you know, of good farming practices, but also because we have a lot of people that come up to the farm. You know, we don't want to be spraying uh, DT or uh, just like any really harmful chemical and then like have an event or a group of children come up 
and touch things and so we really keep it minimal and we've been really fortunate where we haven't um, had really bad pests on the roof we've definitely had our fair share but never like we're an entire crop um, succumbs to a, a pest invasion um, so we grow all different types of vegetables, mostly salad greens. We do a lot of arugula, mustards, lettuces, um, kale, chard, different bok choys. Um, but then we also do all different types of fruiting crops. We do tomatoes, eggplant, cucumbers, um, peppers. Oops. Peppers. Um, we do root veg like radishes and carrots. Um, turnips, pretty much anything that you can grow, we've tried growing. Um, over the years, we've definitely modified um, what we've grown. I mean, in, in years past, not while I was farming, but there's been like soybeans grown on the farm, uh, corn at one, <laughs> one point was on, I've seen a picture of a corner where there was like corn growing on the rooftop. Um, but we've really like honed it over the past, what is it, 2018, 2018 over the past eight years. Um, but yeah, I mean, zucchini, we grow different herbs, we grow a lot of edible flowers, we grow cut flowers, um, yeah, really tasty things. And then, so where does all this food go? Um, I would say about 60% of our food goes to wholesale channels, so that's two restaurants, two grocery stores, um, and that's maybe not the, the, I wouldn't say it's like direct to our community, but because we are a for-profit business it's we are selling wholesale because that's how we are able to stay afloat um, so 60 percent of what we grow goes to different restaurants in New York City but no more than five miles away from our farms which is pretty amazing and obviously one of the benefits of having the farm right in the city um, is we're reducing the number of miles that our food is traveling from farm to plate um, but then the remaining 40 percent goes to our markets and our CSA at our Navy Yard farm we have a 40 person CSA are you guys familiar with what CSA stands for? Okay. Um, Forty-person CSA at our Long Island City Farm. We have a sixty-person CSA, and then our goal—I don't know if we're going to get it—but our goal at the Sunset Park Farm is to have a hundred-person CSA. Um, so that's going straight into our community, which feels really good. Um, and then we have markets. So on our Long Island City Farm on Saturdays, we have an open house day where people can come up walk around, jump in with the farmers if they want to like try their hand at compost, you know, turning compost or weeding or whatever they're doing that day. Um, and then they can also buy fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, and then on Sundays, we go to Magog Park in Greenpoint um, for a down to earth farmers market. And then with our new farm, we hope to have an on site market and then also get into another Grow NYC market nearby. Um, but all of our existing markets and of course, future markets as well will accept, uh, do accept SNAP benefits. So that's pretty neat to say that hasn't been the case in, in the past. Um, yeah, that's where our food goes to. Um, okay, so a little, that was a little kind of very general ecological benefits. This is the big building that I was talking about that they put up right in front of our, our view. <laughs> we used to have a complete uh, unhindered view of the city. Um, and then they built that last year. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, pretty, it's a nice building, but I think it's supposed to look like a ship because we're in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, so talked a little bit about the benefits of the planet and also about our farming, um, but now I want to talk a little bit about the profit element of our company. Um, so one department, other than farming, uh, that we have is our events department, and they're pretty amazing. They throw all different, they throw and host all different types of events. Um, so you can see someone's getting married <laughs> on our farm. Um, people are standing in the walkways between um, beds, so those are the pews, uh, if you were like in a church. Um, but also we host, um, we throw our own dinners that people can buy tickets for. Um, we also do all different types of workshops, everything from like how do you compost to uh, kombucha to last year we did one on eating insects, uh, which I did not attend. Um, uh, but yeah, they do a really good job of like, you know, any topic that has to do with food, sustainability, um, or farming, the, our events team will try and do a workshop on it. Um, but then we also have like yoga on the farm. Um, yeah, any, any type of event that you would throw at like a 
events hall. We, we can do it. Um, and we do them at both farms. So this is, this is a picture of our Navy Yard farm, but we also have events at our Long Island City farm. Um, and it's a great way to bring people up to the farms so that they can see what we're doing other than having like tours or open house days. Um, it's another opportunity to peop for people to engage in our space. Um, and then the other, de other department of Brooklyn Grange is design build. So that's what I've transitioned to this year. Um, and design build is basically a way to take Brooklyn Grange off of the roof and into the city to other people. Um, so we've been hired by private residences, uh, businesses, nonprofits, um, even the UN. The picture on the right is from the UN. We built them an edible garden two years ago. Um, and this is for any type of green space. It could be a green roof, it could be um, a backyard, it could be a green wall, um, someone's front yard, whatever, whatever people want, as long as it involves some kind of plants, we are usually game to try it out. Um, one of our biggest projects was installing a green roof on the offices of uh, Vice Media in Williamsburg. So this picture on the left is from their rooftop. It, this is a very small view, but it's pretty, a pretty amazing like rooftop meadow and they have a small edible garden. Um, so yeah. And a really cool part about design build is that through uh, the Department of Environmental Protection, which offers grants to combat combined sewage overflow, we can partner with lower income neighborhoods and nonprofits to build green spaces. So that's what we did in 2017 um, in the South Bronx uh, neighborhood of Mott Haven. So we partnered with the organization called Sobro and built two green roofs um, on two of their buildings. One on the left is just a green roof. So this is the um, extensive green roof that I was talking about earlier. It's very shallow soil, mostly sedum. And then the one on the right is the other rooftop, which is a combination of a green roof and um, vegetable beds. So these are the residences in the building. Um, planting some vegetables and it's a pretty neat project because one building is a business incubator incubator and then the other building um, houses formerly homeless people um, so it's a pretty neat uh, aspect of our design build team is that we can engage with all different levels of income in in, the, in our community um, so on that note talking about people the third P um, our goal is really to engage with our community as much as possible. So we're hosting events, we have tours. Um, we want people to be able to come up to our space and see what we're doing, become connected to their food. I mean, that was one of the main reasons why Brooklyn Grange was started, was to really connect not just ourselves growing food, but also other people as well. Um, engaging the community so you can see all different people come to our roofs, whether it's for parties or workshops or classes. Um, it's pretty neat. The best, my favorite part about having people up on the farm is the kids that get to come to our farm. So through City Growers, um, which is our sister organization, they're a nonprofit. They host classes of uh, students from the city, K through 12, um, any type of school, public, private, charter. They get to come up to the farm. They have their own learning beds where they can try vegetables. They can plant different vegetables and really become introduced to their food. I mean, some of these kids are more familiar with where their food comes from, but some of them just know food as like what's, in the, what's um, at the grocery store. So it's pretty amazing to see them come up and like associate the mint plant with bubble gum or, you know, chewing gum or something or, um, you know, trying like green sorrel and, and saying that it tastes like a lemon head <laughs> or pulling a carrot out of the ground and being like, oh my God, I didn't know that a carrot grew under the ground. Um, so it's really great to have uh, kids up on the roof and introducing them to food, getting them passionate about food, um, yeah, and just and learning where where and how their food is grown. Um, so last slide, I think maybe one more. No, one more. <laughs> last slide. What is our uh, the impact of urban farming and how are we playing a role in urban farming? Um, Having three farms now, we're at a little over five acres, right? One, a little over four acres. Um, we're not going to be able to feed the entire city. You know, there's eight million people in the city. Um, our farms produce uh, around 60,000 pounds of vegetables. The two farms produce around 60,000 pounds of vegetables. It's a season. It'll be even more with Sunset Park. 
but that's still a drop in the bucket of what's needed to feed the entire city. But I think urban farming, and especially what we do, because we are able to bring people up to our farms and show them what we're doing, um, I think is, is the real impact is how we are able to inspire people to become passionate about their food and connected to their food. Um, and I think that's really the power of Brooklyn Grange, besides being able to say, like, we grow hundreds of pounds of vegetables, which is also really amazing. Um, but it's the fact that we're able to share that with our community. Um, and I think that's, that's pretty great. So, that's it. Thank you. So this was a terrific presentation. And um, I'm going to take the liberty as moderator to um, take a break and have everyone have the ability to ask questions of you first before we move into you, Ms. Chan. Is that okay? okay. All right. So um, one thing that, if you said it, I missed it. So nobody goes into this like, oh, I think I'll just start a rooftop farm. What is your educational background? And please use the mic and um, just press it, make sure the green button is on. It won't be amplified, but it'll get into the tape recorder. Okay, so tell me your educational background. How did you learn to do this phenomenal work? Um, I was not trained in farming at a school or anything like that. I uh, actually studied political science, um, but I joined the farm crew in 2014. And um, besides Brooklyn Grange, I worked at another farm in the Rockaways called Edgemere Farm. And other than that, that is where my farming education um, I also really love watching farming videos, so on YouTube there's a couple of different channels that I follow. Um, Curtis Stone is one, J.M. Fortier, he's a Canadian farmer um, that I really like. Um, the Never Sink Farm as well, which is in upstate New York. Um, but most of it has been through working at Brooklyn Grange and just learning you know, things either through books or... Learning from YouTube. your teachers. Yeah, and, and from my teachers, of course. Yeah. yeah. So I'm really interested, you mentioned about the SNAP access. Mm -hmm. So does all of New York City provide SNAP access or are there just certain markets? I think, I'm not 100% sure, but I think all of Grow NYC and Down to Earth markets, which is the one that we're at in Greenpoint, accept SNAP benefits. Okay. I know it's a real struggle. If any of you have ever looked at like the USDA data to see that the number of farmers markets have, have increased phenomenally, but then if you go back and you look at the percentage that um, allow SNAP benefits, it's uh, quite depressing. And the reason for that, as much as I've been able to discover, is it's not easy. They have to apply for the machines. Yeah, there's, well, um, I think the way that they do, at least the, I know the way they do it at Down to Earth Market, which is the one that we're in, um, in Greenpoint, is that you there's a representative who runs the market, a market manager. Yes. And whoever has SNAP benefits goes to that person and gets like coins or chips right. that they then shop with at the different farm stands. Right, right. Okay, um, before I open it up to everybody else, so I'm really interested in evaluating measures of well being. Mm -hmm. And I'm I've not seen really good um, tools for evaluation and I think we really need them in order to prove why um, government officials should be funding or taxpayers should be funding many more of these. Mm -hmm. So for example, have crime rates decreased? Have there been any evaluation tools looking at happiness? Mm -hmm. any, any kind of ideas on that? I'm not sure. I know my happiness has increased. <laughs> <laughs> I think probably everybody who goes to that farm has got to have their happiness increase, but we got to have tools for measurement. So I'm just throwing that out there. I think um, City Growers, the nonprofit that uses our farms as a classroom, um, they use, they certainly use tools where at the beginning of, the, of their workshops with the students, they'll say like, who's afraid of you know bees? Or what do you think of this vegetable? And then at the end of the workshop, and after they've gone through their different lessons, they'll ask the same questions to compare. Um, so I think they are more, they probably have better data. What about the- a nonprofit that, that they need to have that. Right, and what about the police department? Can they give you any data on, 
you know, since this farm has been operating, we see a reduced rate of crime. Okay, well, these are just things to think about because I think it's a really powerful influence. And unless we start tapping and monitoring it to show the benefits, you know, I think we're at a disadvantage. It's really good to have that data. And just as one um, other thing. So the DEP d did help fund our second and third farms. The DEP, the Department of Envi Environmental Protection, has a grant that um, you can apply to basically if you're adding green space back into the city because of the combined sewage overflow problem that we have, they will help fund your project. Um, it's not working. Mm -hmm. Do you want Oh, this? no, it's all good. Okay. I was just gonna like. Um, they'll, they will help fund your project if you can prove that you're gonna be adding green space and they'll come and like inspect your property or whatever. Um, so the, the Navy Yard Farm, which is not this one, it was first slide, yeah. um, and the farm in Sunset Park both were partially funded by the DEP. Okay, and, oh gosh, I, oh, did, were you affected by Hurricane Sandy? Uh, in the Rockaways? Or yeah. In, or uh, the, farm. the farm. The, no, so the Navy Yard Farm and the Long Island City, City Farm were both totally fine. We did lose some beehives, but other than that, we were totally, totally cooked. Okay, I think um, we were expecting it to be a lot worse. I wasn't at the farm at the time, but I've, I've heard stories where right. um, afterwards when there was no power in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, uh, Gwen, one of the founders, was walking up you know, 12 flights of stairs to get to the roof. Um, it was basically like nothing had happened. So they were pretty protected in that area. So this is, because this is a for-profit, I'm really interested in knowing about the founders. Mm -hmm. You know, what was their vision? How did they get it? How and why did they get it started? Um, yeah, so the founders are, uh, there's three of them, Gwen Chance, um, Ben Flanner, and Anastasia Flakius. Um, they didn't know each other before Brooklyn Grange. Um, Gwen was uh, installing, uh, has a background in nonprofits. I think she was in Asia for some time working in nonprofits, and then when she came back to Brooklyn, she was actually working at Roberta's when the three of them met. Um, working in their garden, installing and maintaining their backyard garden. Roberta's is a pizza place in Bushwick. Um, and Ben um, was working in marketing and was just always really obsessed with food and became passionate about farming after he um, went to a grape farm for a project um, in Australia, I believe, because um, he, he was doing consulting marketing. And um, decided that he wanted to switch careers. He applied to, I think, um, a farm school in uh, Santa Cruz in California, got rejected, and started basically just reading and learning as much as he could on his own. And he started the Eagle Street Rooftop Farm with Annie Novak in Greenpoint. And that was like a smaller, um, smaller green roof, kind of like a test as to see like if you can grow vegetables on a roof how much space you would need. Um, so he started that. And then Anastasia was just in the food industry world. She was working, I forget which restaurant group she was at. Um, but the three of them basically met at Roberta's um, and like realized that they all had the same vision of you know, having a more meaningful job, making the city a better place, bringing food back into the city. Because um, this was in 2009 before a lot of like the importance of local food, you know, it surged. And I'm sure it was on people's radar then, but it certainly surged since then. Yeah, Christina, did you have any questions for your co-presenter? No, no, no. All right, <laughs> let me open it up. Um, we're gonna have, Sarah is gonna pass the mic if anybody has, a, has questions in the audience. You know, I do a 30 minute radio show. I could fill up 30 minutes of questions with these wonderful people, but um, I need to not be so selfish. So Sarah, if you wanna just pass the mic around yeah. that. Uh, let me do a quick question. Okay. We don't wanna miss one answer. Uh -huh. Oh, you know what? I have an idea. How about Maybe if you you come oh, okay. to the podium and then, I'll just and then the you do the out questions? Out. Okay. okay. And then as a moderator, I'll just stand. <laughs> so I have like seven questions. Okay. Well, hey, Shoot. Okay. <laughs> so the first one is um, back 
correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe in New York City, the Farmers Market Nutrition Program um, allows uh, Grow NYC and the other farmers markets to accept vouchers from not only SNAP, but also WIC, the Women in Infants and Children mm -hmm. Program, and the Senior Nutrition Program. I'm not sure. I just know that at, a, at the markets we're at, we accept SNAP. I'm sorry, I don't know as much as I probably should. 60,000 pounds of vegetables. Do you have enough space to compost all the stems and leaves? And yeah. Um, on each of our farms, we have compost piles. At uh, our Long Island City Farm, we actually have um, a forced air system with, I think, four bays where you can put vegetable scraps. Um, at our Navy Yard farm, we have three separate compost piles. Um, so yeah, we're composting as much as we can, not only from the from the farm, and uh, as far as like leftover vegetable matter, but also from events from our office, we compost our scraps. Um, so we're doing as as much as we can. Great. Um, any plans to reclaim that nutrient-rich water that runs off when it rains? Um, we have tried, like, you know, uh, to set up like rain barrels, um, but because we don't have, because we're so limited in, in space already, you know, we are looking at our farms and analyzing the farms on the square foot basis, whereas every square foot counts and rural farms are looking at like acres of land. So. Um, unfortunately, because we are limited in space, we don't have a rainwater collection system. The impact, the what we can contribute to rainwater to uh, stormwater mitigation is the fact that our farm acts as like a big sponge and slows down water before it hits the drains. So even though it's still hitting the drains, it's at a much slower rate than if it were hitting, you know, a regular rooftop or the street or sidewalk. I'm wondering if it ever seems too sunny. Like how many hours? Do you get into windy? Um, wind is definitely m the greater culprit um, when we see plant damage. Um, yeah, wind is can be really tough on the plants, especially on the rooftop. Um, but we've learned how to trellis things differently, um, or you know, like if it's really windy the night before, we have a big harvest. We won't. Heart will be on the lookout for damaged leaves, um, but for the most part, plants are really resilient and adapt. Um, so we haven't seen that much damage from wind. Sun, on the other hand, I mean, full sun is the best <laughs> is what what you want when you're growing vegetables, when you're growing food. Um, for our design build team, I would say they want more sun, um, or we, because I'm now part of that team. Um, we want we want to see more sun when we go onto rooftops because. Um, we're dealing with uh, residences or businesses that are probably in um, denser communities or denser uh, neighborhoods in New York City, and therefore they're blocked by buildings, so they won't get full sun exposure, whereas our rooftops were like the highest building in the area and therefore have um, full sun exposure. Can you talk a little bit about the design of the soil compositions? Mm -hmm. Root, yeah, yeah. So we um, uh, we get our our soil from this company called Roof Light. They're based out in Pennsylvania, and it's a special blend designed for rooftops. It's um, a combination of compost from mushroom production. So Lancaster County in Pennsylvania is like the densest mushroom production area in like the whole country and after they produce these mushrooms they have all this leftover compost and they were looking for ways to you know be able to sell it or reuse it or whatever and they realized that if they combine that mushroom compost with um, a lightweight aggregate of different stone and clay materials um, you can make a growing medium for uh, rooftop uh, green roofs not necessarily farms but it's basically a, a combination of that mushroom combo compost and then lightweight stones um, that are porous and absorb water um, but it's very it's very uh, compost rich so that you're able to grow vegetables within it and have a lot of soil so on our first farm I think there's like a million pounds of soil and then on our second farm it's a million and a half um, so yeah it's a lot of a lot of soil up there um, so that we're able to grow stuff. Yeah, I have a question for uh, both of you. <laughs> so, 
We can't just clear for just now. we'll just one right now. Are you gonna talk more? Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. 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 When Michelle is done, Christina is gonna come cool. up and do yeah. Loved what you talked about this morning. Oh thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um I can ask you the same question after your <laughs> yeah. or you can answer it now if you want. Yeah. But um yeah, like what uh what do you think Brooklyn Brain is doing to create just food systems already mm -hmm. and what does it need to do to yeah. Um, so as a for-profit for business, it's definitely more of a challenge for us to create more just food systems because we are selling our vegetables, you know, to wholesale channels, um, even though we are also at farmer's markets and CSA, more than half of our food does go to wholesale. Um, but for example, with our third farm in Sunset Park, we are trying to um, partner with basically private donors to um, to subsidize the CSA so that low, lower income members of the community can get these shares. Um, it's really difficult because we are a for-profit company, so you can't just get grants necessarily to do this. Um, but it's, it's definitely a challenge. So as a as a business i mean we have to be able we can't do all of the other things that we're doing as far as like growing vegetables in new york city having people up to our farms um if we're not making any money and so a big part of that is selling our vegetables where we can yeah, yeah. um hopefully i can answer that within my okay yeah within yep. okay. okay suzanne do you have any questions um no i was just wondering oh, i knew wait, we got let's read <laughs> <laughs> So I am new at gardening, and I was wondering, um, I found it was a rude awakening and a little harder than I thought it would be, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering what your biggest challenges were. As a rooftop farmer, um, I think there's a lot of challenges of being on top of buildings um, that a rural farmer might not necessarily have to deal with, and some of them are kind of silly. like dealing with freight traffic uh, with the businesses below us you know they're also trying to use the freight elevator and we need to get all of our vegetables from our walk-in into our uh, delivery vehicle and it's 90 degrees and we've been waiting for um, waiting for the freight to arrive or like receiving materials can be really tough whereas um, a rural farm or a ground level farm can just have you know their compost dropped off right on site we have to have our compost dropped off and then brought up in small increments up to the farm um so little things like that really add up um yeah i mean there's a there's a lot of challenges we also um, are limited in the types of tools that we can use so um, we can't use obviously we can't use tractors um, even uh, a very popular tool on market farms is uh, is a BCS machine. It's like a stand behind tractor. Um, we can't have that on our roof, so we're relying on manual labor, which is a real is is a challenge in and of itself. And I and I just want to say too, as far as the food justice uh, question, I'll, a big part of what we're able to do is have kids up to the farm through city growers and be able to educate them and introduce them to. Um, different food or different food systems and connecting them with their food and I think that's a really pow powerful part of um, of Brooklyn Grange's mission. So. Do, fa do farm workers earn a living wage and do you get health care benefits? Um, you are a, a full-time staff at Brooklyn Grange do receive health health care you have to work a certain number of hours to receive health care um, so I, I'm not sure I'm not in HR, so I don't know <laughs> the full spectrum. Um, but our company does offer, um, I forget the name of the program that we use. Um, I'm sorry, it's not coming to me. It's like a, it's like a subsidy. Like our co it's not necessarily insurance, but it's, our company offers a subsidy to pay for insurance, which you can obtain through the New York State, New York State um, Market Exchange. And do, the, do the workers receive a wage that is sufficient enough to live in the area where they're working. Yeah, our farm crew is paid $15 an hour. 
Um, so most of them are working on the farm three days a week, and then they have a, su- a supplementary job, like at a restaurant or maybe with another landscaping company. It's tough. I mean, f- uh, New York City, the $15 minimum wage is a wonderful thing, but it also means that um, it makes it a little more difficult for us, especially because the price of vegetables is, doesn't go up. You know, vegetables, you can't really charge like $20 a pound for arugula. Um, and we don't want to be charging $20 a pound. We want to be affordable. Um, so it does mean that our farm crew are getting paid $15 an hour. Anybody else going on? Okay. So, Michelle, thank you so much. Thank you. mic over to Christina Chan and she is going you know was everybody in the audience during the lunch session okay if you want to give us a brief you know a, a summation from your lunchtime talk and then launch into <coughs> the beautiful images that I know you're going to show us today sure so at our lunchtime talk it was me and a few other farmers of color working in New York oh this isn't mine I don't know anything about this. Sorry. <laughs> um, that was probably something that I was okay, going to speak. The uh, and we just talked about some of the realities and challenges that we face farming in the city. We're also youth educators, so we know a lot about. Did you say? Oh yeah, mine says Choi Division. Got it. So I work currently at Randall's Island Farm, but this is my this is my project basically. I'm looking to start my own farm. Um, I don't know if you guys get the joke, but <laughs> Choi Division was banned in the '80s, and Choi means vegetable in Chinese. So there you go. So a little bit about me. I am spending my third year in urban farming right now. I have farmed before in Hudson, and I farmed before in London. Um, They have great city farms, by the way. If you're ever over there, definitely check it out. And I also have a master's in conservation science, and that's kind of how I got into farming. I came in through a lens of land stewardship and wanting to kind of practice agroecology. I was interested in um, growing so that I could maintain soil health, that I could raise bird populations, bee populations, other native pollinators, develop meadows, stuff like that. Um, And I'm also a first generation Chinese American. So I was born in New York and I've often struggled with this idea of, I guess, identity duality. I felt too American to be Chinese, uh, too Chinese to be necessarily fully American. Um, And all this has really informed how I farm and why I've taken this path. Essentially, I've learned that the best way for me to connect through my culture is through food, and by learning how to plant sort of the traditional uh, Chinese vegetables, I've learned more about myself, and I'm also able able to give back to that community. Um, Because my mission is to provide fresh, organically grown, culturally connected crops for the Asian American diaspora of New York. Uh, New York has the largest Asian population outside of Asia. We have, I think, It's about a million people now as as of the last census, and it's only continuing to grow. And while we do have access to fresh vegetables in Chinatown, in Flushing, in Sunset Park, almost, I don't think any of those are organic. If you go into those markets, everything is very inexpensive, which is great, that means everybody can afford to buy it, but we really have no idea of if sprays are being used, and if so, what they are, or where these things are coming from. And going to the farmer's market, I also felt like I wasn't represented either. Some farms will grow like some bok choy and a few things here and there, but they were also not the same things, not the same varieties that I would, I would have chosen to purchase essentially. They weren't the things that like my mother or my grandmother would choose from the market. So I saw this need and I thought maybe that's something that I could do. So I've just got some examples of things that you guys could grow if you were interested. I wasn't sure what kind of audience I would have, so I'm used to talking to farmers usually. So if you guys have questions throughout, I'm happy to take them. Um, But like one of the most common ones is bok choy. Bok choy literally means white vegetable. So you can see here it's got that white stem. And so like I'm holding that in my hand and it's super small. And this is like one of the more valued varieties. Um, The next we have Chinese broccoli, which unlike, I guess like Western broccoli, doesn't form like that big head. And you want the leaves and the stems. But what's great is that it's a cut and come again. So you can plant it in the same way as any other brassica plant, but you get multiple harvests out of it. And I wanted to, make a quick note on the bok choy front. So these are all different types of bok choy. Um, So that's like the tiny little white one. This is like a smaller green one, but like this one's huge. Like it's covering the sky's face. I've never like used that. I don't know anyone who would, but those are often for sale. And if you wouldn't know any better, like you're 
trying to grow for like the community around you, like I'll pick that one because it's huge and it looks lush, but then nobody wants to eat it. So that's the importance of really talking to your community, active listening, and also getting their input. Um, I do also recognize that maybe seed resources out there aren't, they're just not that widespread. So it's hard to necessarily find the right seed company. So there are a few, like if you guys want to know about them, um, I've got a couple I can tell you about later. Um, other varieties of things you can grow. This is Celtis. This is related to lettuce, but instead of growing it for the leaves, it's grown for the stem. So it grows about like a foot, a foot and a half tall. You can actually eat the leaves as you go, and you can cut off the top and eat them separately. But what we would do is we would take that stalk and you would peel it and slice it thinly and either eat it raw or stir fry it quickly. And when it's good, it's got this amazing like nutty flavor to it that tastes like it's almost been stir fried. And that's another one that's great also for like colder season. Like I've got it in the ground now. I put it in like the last week before frost and it's doing really well. Um, long beans are another one. If you have, like we have a gourd tunnel at Randall's Island where we um, hang, uh, we grow vining plants essentially so they can hang down and kids can run through and experience it. These are not only decorative, but they taste really good and they grow really quickly. So these are all things that anybody could add to their farm. Um, another two that are a little bit more unusual Lemongrass especially because it's not something you think would grow well here, but it does phenomenally well. It gets hot enough here in the summer and that does fine. Um, and it comes, once again, it's a continuous harvest. You can cut and come again, which is great. And Shungiku, this one I love because I learned that it's a great companion plant for brassica pests. So if you have like a harlequin bug, I don't know if you guys have seen that, they like destroyed all of our plants last year and we were looking for a way to kind of combat that without spraying or having to go through crushing every single bug. Like that's not a lot of fun. Um, so I found out that this would work because it gives off like this odor that they don't like. Um, but it's also very highly prized in Japanese and in Chinese cooking. So those are, that's basically what I've got. Um, my other goals are outreach and education. This is a picture of the farm I work at now. So you can see um, we've got lots of raised beds. We're surrounded by the Hellgate Bridge. And on the other side is the Triborough Bridge. It's about just about an acre. Um, and my other goals, aside from growing vegetables for the community, is to offer them a chance to come back to the farm and do some planting themselves, either as a way to kind of learn how to grow vegetables, but also to kind of get to know each other and make stronger connections within the community. Um, I also think it's really important because a lot of new immigrants maybe coming from rural backgrounds. And moving to a city can be really daunting, especially New York. So I think the opportunity to kind of go back to something familiar can just make people feel a little bit more happier and more at ease. Um, so yeah, and on that note, I would offer like school field trips and guided tours, but it's really important to me that if we wanna change the food system, we have to continue down the education route because just growing is not enough. That's it. So get in touch if you want. <laughs> Ask me any questions. Okay, great. So I really loved what you said this afternoon about the connection, you know, bringing people back to their culture through food, because it just seems like when we lose that connection, it's gone. And so this is, I think, really important for improving nutrition and public health. Um, so you, tell me a little bit more about the Randall's Island Farm. Is mm -hmm. it a nonprofit? Yes. So it's part of the larger park alliance. So, so if you guys know anything about how that works, it's similar to like Central Park Conservancy. It's a partner organization to the government. So our farm is nestled within the Randall's Island Park Alliance, and they also manage all the sports fields, and they manage the gardens, as well as the wetlands and the salt marsh on the island. Was there any problem with not using pesticides? No. So the farm is always... Uh, we've never sprayed on the farm, um, and that's because we were, you know, feeding kids directly from the gardens. We were planting with them. They were picking leaves and eating them straight away without washing, so we didn't want any risk of that. So not being on a rooftop and being, you know, on the ground, did you have to do any soil remediation? So what they've done is that they've laid landscape fabric down, and then they've built raised beds over it, and that's probably the most common model you'll find in most urban farms. Um, simply because the soil is definitely contaminated. I'm sure they did tests, but Randall's Island used to be like a huge dump site for years. Uh, it was never really residential and it still isn't. So it's, I think it'll never really have a chance to be fully remediated to the point where we would grow our food in it. Yeah, and you know, I was thinking too with the proximity to the, to the, um, to the highways, mm -hmm. 
I'll bet maybe there's still some lead in that soil. Oh yeah, I bet. The gasoline. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that's all I have. I know you had a question, so I'm going to pass the mic over to you. The same question you said you asked. Does that matter? Yeah. Okay. Um, but does anybody else have a question for me? You were conveniently close. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I think you definitely talked about this like concept of like uh, food justice in the way that you are doing this work and. Um, so I don't really have it in the same way, but if you want to talk a bit more, I'd be happy to listen to you. Yeah, because I guess the farm that I'm aiming to build is also a for-profit, but because I am serving, I am catering to an underserved market, yeah. that in itself is all is kind of the food justice aspect, which makes it in some ways an easier question for me to answer than it would have been for Michelle for that reason alone. And your employment on this farm, do you earn a living wage and do you have access to health insurance? Yes, to both. Um, so I make seventeen eighty-five an hour. We get health insurance after we work there for 60 days. The only caveat is that my job is seasonal, so I'm there from March till November. So then there's three months where, well, I guess it's five months that I wouldn't have insurance, and then three months where you're on unemployment. Um, and the only reason I'm lucky enough to have insurance and like a higher wage that it's just above minimum is because it's part of this larger nonprofit. And which nonprofit is it? Randall's Island Park Alliance. Okay. So I just to piggyback on, on the other questions about um, how hard um, it is to farm. And I'm sure you now have experienced that this is really hard work, They're very labor intensive. And now you're dealing with the business part of it. So I'm just wondering, how are you able to change the perception of the people that come to visit as they're, uh, for both of you, you know, the cost of real food? That's a bit tricky, I guess, because our school groups only come once. We don't get like the repeat school, so it's a little harder to say. Um, I guess the best that I can say is most people leave with their their taste buds and their, their minds changed a little bit. They realize at least that vegetables can taste really good. I can't say for sure whether or not they'll place a higher value on it, but they're more likely to eat them at least. So that's the best I got. Yeah, I agree. It is a difficult question people who are learning about how hard farming is, they're the farm crew, mm -hmm. um, not necessarily the visitors, but we do have uh, pretty extensive tours, um, the people who come up and like watch the farmers work as they walk around the, walk around the rooftop, um, or attend a workshop. Um, so yeah, it is, it, that is a tricky question, just because it's not like they're jumping in and shaping beds or flipping compost, but they are seeing that um, and I'm sure our tour guides talk about how difficult farming is and the different challenges, whether it's pests or um, tools that we use or can't use, et cetera. Suzanne, do you have a question? No. <laughs> Sarah, do you have a question? You certainly have a wonderful background. I, I apologize for not passing you the mic no earlier. No problem. Um, actually, I'm curious to know what one of the crops the show tastes I think it was shown with lemongrass. Oh, the shunkike? Yeah. It's actually not my favorite. It's got quite a strong, it tastes almost, it's very like herbal, maybe a little like a camphor note to it, um, but it's commonly used in like salads to dress them up a little bit, or you can um, saute them lightly as well. But I'd say, yeah, I think it works better as a, a lighter garnish for sure. Okay, so but oh, it's but the, um, uh, oh yeah. I was gonna say, it's, it's, oh, also, it's chrysanthemum. Yeah, right? yeah so it's, it's the chrysanthemum, chrysanthemum greens. Them. Yeah, it's the. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, it's chrysanthemum greens. So it's the edible leaf version of the flower. So instead of growing it for the flowers, this one's being grown for the leaves. Yeah, I was just gonna ask how you found out or knew that that would be a good mechanism for you mentioned it really specifically in the show. Um, how did you find out that that would be a good mechanism for mentioned it releases some compound that pushes away certain pests? I learned that uh, at another conference. I went to. Was it the Northeast Sustainable Agriculture Working Group Conference? And they had a tour of the urban farms of Philly. And one woman just mentioned it offhand at her farm. And I was like, wait, what? I need to take these notes right now. <laughs> have you seen it work? Like, do your brassicas? It's our first year trying it out because I only just found out about this at the end of last season. So we're like getting it ready now.
you learn the other concepts? Is where where can people go to learn about these magical cross combinations of planting? I feel like there's a pretty good there's a good internet resource for that, right? And I feel like if you read Elliot Coleman's book, yeah. New Organic Grower, companion planting is pretty heavily covered and like natural sort of um, enemies, natural predators and enemies. Um, if you ever have questions, hopefully you have uh, like a, an extension, like a university extension service near you maybe. Like we're lucky enough to have Cornell Cooperative Extension and they've been phenomenal. I have actually met a couple of people in the in this past season. There's one woman I'm trying to collaborate with, and she's been trying to do this, I think, for a long time. She's in her 50s now, and she's been trying to start her own farm for a while. So it might have been like very serendipitous that we happened to meet, and it was at a class that was teaching about the business um, and accounting of farming, essentially. So. I would say to uh, you, can come up to you. We can turn the mic. <laughs> The you know, you thought you were having a small audience. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is great. This is great. Um, the farm that I worked at in the Rockaways Edgemere Farm, they also grow a few different crops for uh, the different types of backgrounds that they see in the community. Um, the one, I can't remember, there's a certain eggplant that's grown in Nigeria. Can't remember the name, but... the garden egg? It was a couple of years ago. Um, but they grow things like callaloo because there's a heavy West Indies uh, population near the farm. So it's, yeah, it's, it's pretty nice to see when um, urban farms and community gardens can grow the vegetables that like people don't see at the grocery store and want to get their hands on. I was wondering, did you grow the Chinese uh, broccoli last year? Because it looks an awful lot like broccoli rabe. And I love the idea that it's cut and come again. And I've never successfully grown broccoli rabe, so I may try this. And do you grow it from seed? Yes, you can grow it from seed. Um, I will say it grows very similarly to broccoli rabe, but it does not taste like broccoli rabe. Because broccoli rabe, is, uh, to me, is like very much more bitter. Um, this is a little bit sweeter, but it still has a, a slight bitter note. So if you like broccoli rabe, you might like this as well. Um, like, What trouble did you have with growing your broccoli rabe? Was it with heading? making little heads on them or? Um, I think mostly that it just was really thin and um, never got really strong and was never able to come back after cutting it the first time. Okay. So similar to like regular broccoli, you know, you cut the head and then you can have the shoots, mm -hmm. you know, and, but um, it wasn't as, as strong and healthy as, as I would have liked. Okay. Um, it could be so many different things. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I find if it's, I didn't put enough amendment in the soil early on, and if it's just not in the right spot, if it's just not getting enough sun, if it's a little too shady, it's not too happy either. Yeah, so I grew it in the southern exposure along with arugula, mm -hmm. and so I thought that would have been a good spot, but it didn't like it there, so maybe I'll just try it somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, that would be my first guess, yeah, because we had trouble with a couple of other varieties too. Also sometimes, like my, from my experience, one of the first mistakes I made was packing things in too closely in the bed, um, and then everything just looked really sad and just not very good, so. I had a couple of vegetables that they turned out too thin and I couldn't really get them to come back either. But also, are you in the, like, the New York area or where are you based? Um, just outside of New Jersey. Okay, like for us it was really hot last summer and I think I struggled with some of my brassicas. They would just go to, go to flower, they would bolt instead and get really thin also. So it could have been the weather last year also. And it was very wet mm -hmm. in June and yep. uh, I am definitely horizontally challenged, so I packed in too. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no. So a lot of this is still very much like a new project for me, and I'm getting things going. At, at the Randalls Island Farm, I would say it's not residential, so we can't really, we don't really have like crime stats, I guess. Um, and I guess like well-being of the workers hasn't really changed. I guess I'm happier, <laughs> too. Um, 
But I have seen, like, uh, there was, like, a family who came by, and they saw, like, the sign for bok choy, and then, like, they took a picture near it. So you, that was that showed me, like, representation matters. Like, they would have had a great time at the farm anyways, but seeing something that was specifically important to them resonated with them. So it's only one anecdote, but I like to hope that other people have had similar experiences. Yeah, I encourage you to collect those, because I think that that's what's going to fuel this movement. I there are uh, refugees that come into my community in the Midwest, and having access to gardens really makes a difference for them in terms of connecting with each other, and then having that connection to home, mm -hmm. as you mentioned. Yeah. And then, you know, you think about the nutrients that are in these fresh foods, and you think, well, is anybody monitoring a reduction of diabetes rates or depression? You know, all of those factors that food is connected to, but I don't know, unless you're really trained in that area, maybe you don't think about that impact. Right, yeah. Okay, so are there any other questions from the floor? Okay, then I am gonna turn the mic over to both of you again and give us a closing statement. One of my closing questions is, if you had a, a chance to put a billboard up on the highway, and put something up there, a message about what you're doing and what you want people to know about it. Um, could you tell us what that might be? And so a closing message and <laughs> a closing message and your billboard. Yeah, We're gonna make it. So. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be good. Um, closing message. Um, well, it sounds like you guys are farming and um, growing your own vegetables, which I uh, applaud uh, very much. Um, so if you have any questions and want, or want to come to Brooklyn Grange, please reach out. You, uh, my email is on the other side. Um, but I'd be happy to have anybody up there. Um, so that can be my closing message, an invitation to further learning. Um, and then for the billboard, um, a couple of years ago, we uh, we had like a staff retreat where we did some fun exercises. And one of them was we drew like uh, on a large piece of cardboard I, um, a stick figure and the idea was to make a dating profile for Brooklyn Grange and so we named like all the different things that you think of when you uh, when you're talking or thinking about Brooklyn Grange and my favorite one was Br Brooklyn Grange um, a little different but a lot of fun and so I feel like that's that's our new internal <laughs> slogan uh, because we really are a little different but we are <laughs> Um, I guess my closing message, okay. I guess this is like a larger topic, but this is another one that touches similarly on to the value of food. Um, often people, when they go out for a meal, don't consider ethnic cuisine to be worth paying for. So this is why there also isn't a demand for organic vegetables. Even if people would like to eat organic Asian or Latin or African vegetables, people don't value this as, a, as an experience. You would go out to an Italian restaurant and pay fifty dollars a plate. You don't think about it. You'll go to a Chinese restaurant, and if the dish is like more than like ten dollars, people are like, "Why is it so expensive? I don't want to eat here." So that I would say, when you go out to eat, kind of think, check yourself. You know, because everybody's had these thoughts. I've definitely had those thoughts, and that's okay. Because the first step is to realize that you're having that thought and try to like reprogram yourself and like decolonize your mind. And then my billboard would say related to that, it's like food is culture. And we all have a culture, right? So everything, everything we eat is part of who we are. Um, it's part of everything around us. And it's a good way to celebrate our differences, but also celebrate how we're the same. There's a really good book out called You and I Eat the Same. And it comes from Rene Redzepi and Chris Yang. And Rene Redzepi is like the head chef at Noma. And he holds these kind of like big food symposium gatherings. And these writings come out of that. But this book is about how we really have far more similarities in the way that we eat rather than differences. So I highly recommend checking that out and remembering that, you know, we all go to eat, so. <laughs> um, I have to ask one question because this came up during the lunchtime panel and during which time I was feeling really white. Um, and I thought, oh, um, we really struggle with racism issues in the food system. And I really wanted to touch on that. And I wish our other panelists were here to really further enrich that discussion. But you mentioned decolonizing the diet. I don't 
don't know if a lot of people would get that. So help, uh, let's pretend I'm interviewing you, mm -hmm. and I say, help me understand what you mean by decolonizing the diet. So I guess for, it, I feel like it applies a little bit less to myself, because once again, I think Asian Americans have brought over the Asian way of eating with them more successfully than other cultures have been able to. Um, but from what I'm told and from what I've seen, um, black and Latinx communities often don't have access to their more culturally relevant vegetables. So the food in their neighborhoods maybe are things that they were given, like they're given a lot of wheat-based products, whereas maybe they would normally be eating more rice and corn-based products. So they would have to stop and kind of realize like these are not the things that maybe we would have eaten before and kind of work those out, I guess. It's a really complicated thing to answer. Um, and I think it is so individual for each of us. Um, and, but at the same time, it doesn't mean that you can't eat everything too, because we don't all eat the same thing all the time, right? Like I'm not at home eating dumplings every day. That would be crazy. <laughs> I love pizza, you know, you gotta mix it up. Um, so there is also like a balance too. But I feel like we could talk about this for a very long time to try and figure out exactly what that means. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, no, I feel like you're okay. Yeah. I guess if anything, it's more about our perceptions of food, maybe not exactly what we're eating. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for helping us understand that. Any other questions? Going once, going twice? All right. You know what? We were a small but really focused and interested <laughs> group. And I want to thank you so much for being here and being part of this conference and, you know, going forth and making the world a better place. So thank you so much.